Hey guys, it's Anne. Welcome to the channel. If you're new here, this channel is all about worm farming, mostly inside, and I do a various amount of bins and a various kind of worms. These worms in particular we're going to talk about today are European night crawlers. Usually a pretty good size worm and, you know, is good enough for fishing as well as also good enough for composting. So we haven't looked in on these guys in a long time, like I think only once since I've been back from vacation. But I did, uh, I did give them some kind of weird food last time. So let's have a look and see what they're doing. Let's see what the castings are doing. Looks like the top part here is getting nice and, and finished. I still see quite a few worms over here in this uh, mostly finished area. And that just usually means one of a couple of things. Usually there's food here that they're not done eating or there's just, uh, you know, not enough things to entice them to go that way. Generally, if you want them to move, you're going to need to get, you know, reduce the moisture and then also, you know, not feed over here. So I'm going to kind of look through and kind of fluff this up and reduce the moisture. Hopefully if I can get some air into here, then the lower part of this, it's almost a foot deep. So I'll put the metric conversions in there for you, but it's a pretty deep bin and the bottom part does get kind of uh, wet. And uh, unfortunately in super wet conditions, you can get a buildup of carbon dioxide, ammonia, things that are bad for the worms. And so by fluffing up and getting some air into the deeper parts of the bin, I prevent that. So just kind of not doing a, a crazy amount of fluffing here, but I am seeing quite a few worms. So, um, but the bedding in here is, you know, that you can look at here, it is primarily my paper prepared bedding, which is about 75% shredded cardboard and junk mail. And then, 20% uh, coconut coir, give or take, depending. Usually if there's a lot of junk mail like paper instead of cardboard, I will try and bump up the coconut coir a little bit more simply because it seems like paper, I don't know if it's how they make the paper, you know, but it's kind of like gluey. And uh, the coconut coir does help to mitigate any of that stickiness that comes from using paper. And my goal, of course, in life is to keep things out of uh, the landfill. So I'm not going to, you know, throw away paper just because it's not the ideal bedding. The worms will figure out how to consume it. I just have to figure out a way to make it usable in my systems. Okay, so looks like we're, we're getting down to the part that maybe has food. But it is pretty wet. If you see that, you could kind of make a, a worm snowball. It's a little too wet. So it's important that I get in here, especially during the wet season here in the Midwest, in the United States. The humidity is about 60%, so the worm bins don't dry out very quickly when it's that humid in the basement. All right, now to the business end. Um, I think we fed them some kind of goo last time. So let's see what they're doing. They got some bedding. You can definitely see the bedding there. And then I'm seeing kind of a, a mold happening. Doesn't, I don't know, doesn't smell bad or anything. Oh, cool. We have a grain slash worm ball. I think I was a little concerned this would heat up, but it looks like Looks like they're getting in there with those wheat berries. Um, I can still see a little bit of food. Um, there is a mixed nut there. Um, I think those are Brazil nuts maybe. So it looks like if there was any problem with this food, um, we did miss it. Last year's pumpkin stem, that will be there for a while. But we are definitely seeing a lot, a lot of worms in here. If you looked at the concentration as I was going through over here, they are moving over towards this new part, which is, you know, the point of doing a wedge system like this where you continuously 
move the finished castings over to one end. Then you feed at this uh, new end here. And then as they finish up this end, then you move it over and start anew. So you're con continuously making an area that uh, the worms want to move to. So it looks like I really, you know, I am getting the migration that I wanted here. You can see that I have a lot of worms here. So that's good. They're, they're moving out. Oh, look, we've still got some ginger. I think this is going on seven months now for the ginger. And that's fine. You know, slow food is, is fine. Fast food is fine. So long as the worms have enough to eat. Oh, look, they're finally starting to get into the pumpkin stem from last year. The little one, at least. So that's progress. They're usually not gone by the time next year's pumpkins come. <laughs> that's how long a pumpkin stem takes to, to get done. It looks like ginger is definitely going to be on that super slow list, too. All right, well, we've mixed up this part that has got all the food in it right now. And so, per the wedge method, we're going to take this most recent feeding area, and we're going to move that over as well, leaving myself a nice blank spot here to add um, new food and new bedding. Probably should put that underneath. So looking at this here, I did have a question. Somebody was growing night crawlers. I'm not sure where he got them from, but he said that he had a problem with them dying off. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to tell everybody is that not all worms are the same. The worms that I have in my bins here are compost worms. And basically they are the kind of worm that lives in the top foot of soil, mostly the top maybe half, half a foot, six inches, like that far. And if you go and you pick up worms out of your yard, or if you get bait worms, not all bait worms are red wigglers or European night crawlers. Some of them are Canadian night crawlers, and they don't always do as well in a system like this. So if you are getting worms, make sure you're getting compost worms and not worms from your yard because a worm that is used to diving down 10 feet and living in, a, in its own hole is not gonna be happy or survive in a bin like this. All right, let's get these guys some new bedding. I got a really good deal on a big brick of coconut coir for $30 for 88 pounds. I'll put the metric conversion, but it's dirt cheap. Let's put it that way. It was uh, busted open up a little bit, but there wasn't any missing. So I thought, hey, that is perfect. So I get to go a little bit heavy on the coconut coir for a while. All right, we've got a weird feeding today. We are still working through the, uh, the dry goods from CeCe's Move. And what this is, is this is a combination of oatmeal and ground coconut. So it does smell like coconut flakes that have gone bad. I'm not really sure. I'm not calling it a bad smell, but it's definitely, you know, you know you're not supposed to eat it. So I would say, I'm not sure, if you've ever fed coconut itself to the worm bin, please put that in the comments below. This is my first try. I'm gonna just do a very thin veneer of this, and then I'm gonna give them quite a bit of bedding because I have no idea what to expect from coconut. Um, I'm using the ideas to keep things out of the landfill, and so we're keeping it out of the landfill, but I don't know what the worms are gonna do with it. All right, let's get them some bedding to top that off. Okay, now this is the prepared bedding that is the paper and the co coconut coir, like I said before. But as you can see in my hand here, there's also eggshell in here. And then I mix in some liquid kelp or kelp meal, depending on what I have available. I buy this for the bonsais and the orchids. Um, and it is linked in my Amazon uh, links below. But this stuff is great. It works good on plants. It works good to get a nitrogen source to start the bedding to degrade before I feed it to the worms. Um, I love the stuff. Um, I, once I found it, I was like, there is no substitute for it. So that is going to help the worms eat the bedding faster so they can eat more bedding so I can keep it out of the landfill. 
All right, now these worms all started from 500 cocoons in 2019 that I got from Emily the Crazy Worm Lady. And now we probably have maybe five pounds in here. I'll have to check my old videos and see how much it was that I had the last time. Now I have another bin of European night crawlers. So hang on and let me move you over to the other European night crawler bin. Okay, we are back. Now this side is the uh, bin that is the one pound of large adult European night crawlers that Gatano from Northeast Worms gave me. And I think that was almost a year ago. I'll have to check, I'll put that in the notes below. So we're gonna do the same thing here. And we're going to look through the finished end of this bed. But as I'm finding things that aren't done that the worms had pushed up to the top, like pumpkin seeds and sticks. I'm going to move them down to the end where we we know they're still working. So this side, this bin, feels wetter. You can tell that it it has uh, absorbed a lot more water or moisture from the air. And that is one thing that um, I didn't think about when I first started worm farming is that castings actually can absorb water from the air. It's not just the water that you put in there. So if you ever wonder, you know, you look in your bin at one point and it seems like it's okay and you haven't added anything and then a couple weeks go by and it's wetter than it was the last time you looked in on it. It's because they can and do absorb moisture from the air. Because this is a dirt floor basement, whatever the humidity is outside, it is in here and it's been raining quite a bit here. So the basement is about 60 to 70% humidity. And so not only are the castings not drying out very well, they appear to be gaining moisture. So castings are one of those good things that you put in with your garden to keep the moisture as well as a, you know, it's a soil amendment. It's not just about the nutrients and the biology. It's good for holding on to water. Um, but when you're trying to get it to dry out so you can harvest it, Sometimes that is not a helpful property. Uh, so as you're seeing, I'm having a little trouble even getting through it because it is so dense right now. So for the, you know, people that run very deep bins, um, agitating it like this and fluffing it up is necessary because, you know, when things are very, very wet, the chances that the, the bin itself could become anaerobic is, is dangerous. So in particular, especially now that I know that this is very wet, I'm gonna have to come down here more often and make sure that I'm getting through here and keeping it from turning into a solid brick of mud like I'm seeing right here. Now, I haven't added any water to this bin. This is just absorbing it from the atmosphere here. All right, I might actually get put a fan in this room to at least keep the air moving. But yeah, I'm just totally going to turn this up. Yeah. <laughs> There's that crazy cranberry. It's been seven months. <laughs> seven months for this cranberry. Um, they must have some antibacterial properties. Somebody was talking about that in the comments the last time I did a video that uh, cranberries have like a natural antibiotic or antibacterial, if, if you know what that situation is, please put it in the comments below about cranberries. I mean, I know people drink juice for UTIs, but I didn't know that it was just in general a antimicrobial or something. Very interesting what plants do, you know, for us, even when we don't even know about it. All right, well, this is a muddy mess. Definitely gonna put a fan in this room. All right, let's check on what it was that we fed last time. I think both bins got the same thing. They got the uh, mixed grain stuff and uh, I think wheat berries and I'll try and pick it up so you can see those little, little dots. Had it been perfectly, perfectly dry, I probably would have tried to have put it through a blender or something, um, but it was just a little bit damper than what I, damper? Is that a word? More damp than what I thought it would work, you know, and not turn into a paste. So I just put it in here whole, but they do appear to be happy about it. Look at that. Good worms. 
but you can also see another example of why I use coconut coir. This is my paper bedding where there's a lot of paper and it's all stuck itself together and come into this like mat which is going to be hard for the worms to eat because you know there's no air getting between it. So I'm going to definitely make sure that is more thoroughly mixed. So this bin also still has some ginger left but they're definitely rolling through it. Now another thing I wanted to say is you're probably seeing the worms crawling the edges here that uh, disturbing the bin like this does aggravate the worms. I will admit it, but this is a worm channel and I'm showing you what I'm doing. Um, and this is how I manage my worm bins. You know, I'm not saying you have to, I'm not saying this is the absolute best way to do it. However, this is how I do it, so that's what I'm representing. But the worms do crawl for a little bit after I mix up the bin like this, but I do leave the lights on, usually overnight after I've looked in on them. And that does help them stay in the bin. Um, my African night crawlers, the light trick doesn't work with them. I don't know why, but they crawl no matter what I do, so that's why they are in a vermi bag. The European night crawlers will settle down after a couple of hours and they'll be just fine. So it just, you know, depends. I've heard some people say their African night crawlers don't cause a problem at all, and other people are like me. Uh, put in the comments below if you have uh, worms that crawl the walls and take off on you. What kind of worms do you have problems with, and uh, what do you do about it to try and settle the problem? So that's a good amount of worm ball. Look at them. So these all started from a pound of adult worms, so they are breeding nicely. Look at the, the variety of the size of worm there. We've probably got brand new hatchlings and adults all right there clustered together. So they are happy and they are breeding. Okay, so I did harvest a little bit of this from that end about a month ago. Um, but looking at this now, this is just sopping wet and there's no way this is going to get harvested at all anytime soon in its current state. But that's okay. It's getting to be the end of the season and I don't, I don't need any castings right now, so that will be fine. Let's get them some new bedding as well. So another thing about my different, I have different breeds of worms that I am trying to keep separate. Basically for research reasons, because I want to see what different worms do, um, eating certain foods, certain temperatures, all of that. I'm pretty much, you know, very much into the experimentation of what vermiculture can do. And one of the things that I learned the hard way was that if you want to keep species separate, you have to have separate bedding for them. So I have a bucket of bedding that is just for the European night crawlers. I don't use it for anything else because as you can tell, I probably have a baby worm on my hand right there. And if I was to go digging and getting more stuff out of that bin, I would be introducing this hybrid of worm or breed of worm to my other bins. So I keep everything separate. The European night crawlers have their own bedding. The red wigglers have their own bedding. The African night crawlers have their own bedding. And then the mixed bin has their own bedding. I know, I'll get off my soapbox. But if you uh, ever wonder how you're getting your worm bins mixed up when you were trying to keep them separate, that is probably what happened. So again, this is the mixture of coconut, coconut shavings and oatmeal. And I'm just gonna put a, a thin line of that. And again, with when I do these experiments, I always make sure that the worms have some place to go to get away from it in case it heats up, in case it's bad for them in some way. Um, I'm not going to stop experimenting um, because I'm very much about getting rid of any of the um, forbidden foods list. So um, they have plenty of room to go if they don't like this stuff. And the other little bin friends will actually help break into that bit into this food and eventually make it available to them and that's another reason that you don't want just worms in your worm bin you want the whole ecosystem because if the worms can't get to it the other critters bacteria will get into it and eventually the worms will you know have it available to them
All right. Well, if you like this video, give it a muddy thumbs up. If you're not a member of my worm family, click that subscribe button. And if you want to know what I'm doing when I'm doing it, ring that bell icon. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms, and everybody, have a good day.